I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. What sets one southern town apart from another? Or from a northern town or hamlet or a city high rise? The answer must be experience shared between the unknowing majority, it, and the knowing minority, you. All of childhood's unanswered questions must finally be passed back to the town and answered there. Heroes and boogeymen, values and dislikes, are first encountered and labeled in that early environment. In later years, they face, they change faces, places, and maybe races, tactics, intensities, and goals. But beneath these penetrable masks, they wear forever the stocking cap faces of childhood. Mr. McElroy, who lived in the big rambling house next to the store, was very tall and broad, and all the, the years had eaten away the flesh from his shoulders, they had not, at the time of my knowing him, gotten to his high stomach or his hands or feet. <laughs> he was the only Negro I knew, except for the school principal and the visiting teachers, who wore matching pants and jackets. When I learned that men's clothes were sold like that and called suits, I remember thinking somebody had been very bright, for it made men look less manly, less threatening, and a little more like women. <laughs> Mr. McElroy never laughed and seldom smiled, and to his credit was the fact that he liked to talk to Uncle Willie. He never went to church, which Bailey and I thought also proved he was a very courageous person. How great it would be to grow up like that, to be able to stare religion down, especially living next door to a woman like Mama. I watched him with the excitement of expecting him to do anything at any time. I never tired of this or became disappointed or disenchanted with him. Although from the perch of age, I see him now as a very simple and uninteresting man who sold patent medicine and tonics to the less sophisticated people in town, the villages, surrounding the metropolis of stamps. There seemed to be an understanding between Mr. McElroy and grandmother. This was obvious to us because she never chased us off his land. He never chased us off his land. In summer's late sunshine, I often sat under the chinaberry tree, or is that a chinaberry tree, in his yard, surrounded by the bitter aroma of its fruit and lulled by the drone of flies that fed on the berries. He sat in a slotted swing on his porch, rocking in his brown three-piece, his wide Panama nodding in time with the whir of the insects. One greeting a day was all that could be expected from Mr. McElroy after his good morning child or Good afternoon, child. He never said a word, even if I met him again on the road in front of his house or down by the well or ran into him behind the house, escaping in a game of hide-and-seek. He remained a mystery in my childhood, a man who owned his land and the big many-windowed house with the porch that clung to its sides all around the house, an independent black man, a near anachronism in stamps. Bailey was the greatest person in my world, and the fact that he was my brother, my only brother, and I had no sisters to share with him. It was such a good fortune that it made me want to live a Christian life just to show God that I was grateful. While I was a big elbowy and grating, where I was big, elbowy and grating, he was small, graceful, and smooth. When I was described by our playmates as being shit-colored, he was lauded for his velvet black skin. His hair fell down in black curls, and my hair was covered with black steel wool, and yet he loved me. When our elders said unkind things about my features, my family was handsome to a point of pain for me. Bailey would wink at me from across the room, and I knew it was a matter of time before he would take revenge. He would allow the old ladies to finish wondering how on earth I came about, then he would ask, in a voice like cooling bacon grease, Oh, Mrs. Com Com I'm not doing too well here. Oh, Mrs. Coleman, how is your son? I saw him the other day, and he looks sick enough to die. I guess the lady was asked, Die from what? He ain't sick. And a voice oilier, oi 
oilier than the one before. He'd answer with a straight face, from the uglies. <laughs> I would hold my laugh, bite my tongue, grit my teeth, and very seriously erase even the touch of a smile from my face. Later behind the house from the black walnut tree, we'd laugh and laugh and howl. Bailey could count on, whoops. Bailey could count on very few punishments for his consistently outrageous behavior, for he was the pride of the Henderson Johnson family. His movements, as he was later to describe those of an acquaintance, were activated with oiled precision. He was also able to find more hours in the day than I thought existed, and I'm not doing too well here. He finished chores, homework, read more books than I, and played the group games on the side of the hill with the best of them. He could even pray out loud in church and was apt at stealing pickles from the barrel that sat under the fruit counter and under Uncle Willie's nose. That's not right, but it sounds okay. Once when the store was full of lunchtime customers, he dipped the strainer, which we also used to sift weevil, weevils from the meal and flour, into the barrel and fished for two fat pickles. He caught them and hooked the strainer onto the side of the barrel where they dripped until he was ready for them. When the last school bell rang, he picked the nearly dry pickles out of the strainer, jammed them into his pocket, threw the strainer behind the oranges. We ran out of the store. It was summer and his pants were short, so the pickle juice made clean streams down his icy legs, and he jumped with his pockets full of loot and his eyes laughing. How about that? He smelled like a vinegar barrel or a sour angel. After our early chores were done, while Uncle Willie or Mama minded the store, we were free to play the children's games as long as we stayed within yelling distance. Playing hide-and-seek, his voice was easily identified, singing, Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door, who's all hid, asked me to let them in, hit them in the head with a rolling pin, who all is hid, and follow the leader naturally. He was the one who created the most daring and interesting things to do. And when he was on the tail of the pop, the whip, he would twirl off the end like a top, spinning, falling, laughing, finally stopping just before my heartbeat its last, and then he was back in the game, still laughing. All of the needs, there are none imaginary, a lonely child has, the one that must be satisfied if there's going to be hope and a hope of wholeness is the unshaking need for an unshakable God. My pretty black brother was my kingdom come. Oh, gosh, this is a long chapter. Let me look. All right, here we go. In stamps, the custom was to can everything that could possibly be preserved. During the killing season, after the first frost, all neighbors helped each other to slaughter hogs and even the quiet big-eyed cows if they had stopped giving milk. The missionary ladies of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church helped Mama prepare the pork for sausage. They squeezed their fat arms elbow deep in the ground meat, mixing it with gray-nosed opening sage pepper and salt, and made little samples for all obedient children who brought wood for the slick black stove. The men chopped off the larger pieces of meat and laid them in the smokehouse to begin the curing process. They opened the knuckle of the hams with their deadly-looking knives, took out a certain round, harmless bone. It could make the meat go bad and rubbed salt, coarse brown sugar that looked like fine gravel into the flesh. Throughout the year until the next frost, we took our meals from the smokehouse, the little garden that lay cousin close to the store and from the shelves of canned foods. There were choices on the shelves that could set a hungry child's mouth a-watering. Green beans snapped, always the right length. Oops. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Green beans, blah, blah, blah. Juicy red tomato preserves that came into their own on steaming buttered biscuits and sausage. Beets, berries, and every fruit grown in Arkansas. But at least twice yearly, Mama would feel that as children, we should have fresh meat included in our diets. 
We were then given money, pennies, nickels, and dimes, entrusted to Bailey and sent to town to buy liver. Since the whites had refrigerators, their butchers bought the meat from commercial slaughterhouses in Texarkana and sold it to the wealthy even in the peak of summer. Crossing the black area of stamps, which in childhood's narrow measure seemed a whole world, we were obliged by a custom to stop and speak to every, every person we meet, met, and Bailey felt constrained to spend a few minutes playing with each friend. There was a joy in going to town with money in our pockets. Bailey's pockets were as good as my own, and time on our hands. But the pleasure fled when we reached the white part of town. After we left Mr. Willie Williams' do drop in, the last stop before White's Folksville, we had to cross the pond and adventure the railroad tracks. We were explorers walking without weapons into man-eating animals' territory. In stamps, the segregation was so complete that most black children didn't really absolutely know what whites looked like, other than that they were different, to be dreaded, and in that dread was included the hostility of the powerless against the powerful, the poor against the rich, the worker against the work for, and the ragged against the well-dressed. I remember never believing that whites were really real. Sorry. Many women who worked in their kitchens traded at our store, and when they carried their finished laundry back to town, they often set the big baskets down on our front porch to pull a singular piece from the starch collection and show either how graceful was their ironing hand or how rich and opulent was the property of their employers. I looked at the items that weren't on display. I knew, for instance, that white men wore shorts as Uncle Willie did, and that they had an opening for taking out their things and peeing, and that white women's breasts weren't built into their dresses, as some people said, because I saw their brass ears in the baskets. But I couldn't force myself to think of them as people. People were Mrs. Legrone, Ms. Hengre Mrs. H Hendricks, Mama, Reverend Steed, Lily B. and Louise and Rex, white folks couldn't be people because their feet were too small, their skin was too white and see-throughy, and they didn't walk on the balls of their feet the way people did, and they walked on their heels like horses. People were those who lived on my side of town. I didn't like them all, or in fact, any of them very much, but they were people. These others, the strange pale creatures that lived on their alien, unlife, weren't considered folks. They were white folks. <laughs>